topic we're supposed to deal with today is the topic of multiple integrals, in particular double integrals, what they are, how you evaluate them, and what have you. So we'll get started on that. I'd like to look at a problem, though, that uh, caused some questions from both my classes. That's at page, I think it's 793, number 15. It's probably the wrong page. 63. I'm going to, it's a homework problem. I'm going to deal with it in more generality, which for some of you means I'm not going to help you at all. But there's a, a reason for it, just so you don't lose sight of what is supposed to be going on here. Here's a given surface. And let's make it a level surface. As soon as I say that, you're supposed to start thinking uh, gradients, maybe. And let's absorb, well, let's leave a constant over there. Now, the surface that you have given in that problem is really a hyperboloid of two sheets. So I think I can draw that easier. Maybe that's another good reason to do it this way. Over here is a given plane in three space. I'll just call it plane. And what you're supposed to do is move around on your surface and say, aha, right here at x0, y0, z0, I find that there's a tangent plane which is parallel. So the question is, what triple x0, y0, z0 is on the surface and tangent plane parallel to the given plane? And I've written this in two lines because I want to put down the two analytic statements that correspond to them. I think this is the one that maybe some of you missed, I hope, because this is what the section's all about, the second statement. The first statement, the point has to be on the surface, so that means it has to satisfy the equation. That's maybe the most obvious, but again, perhaps the one you looked overlooked. Tangent plane parallel to given plane, that's the one that takes a little bit of thought. The questions as they were posed to me pretty much were what I would call algebraic questions. There was an equation for this. In fact, let me give you the typical one, ax plus by plus cz equals d. Pretty much people wanted to take those numbers a, b, c, whatever numbers were over here, and manipulate them algebraically in order to get an answer. What I would prefer you do is to think of it a little bit more, oh, let's say, along the lines of things we did and realize that really those algebraic entities up here are nice, but really what governs what's going on are the vectors from which they come. For example, over here, we knew the tangent plane came from the gradient of this level surface function. That gradient is normal to that tangent plane. Over here, you're supposed to remember, I'll just try to draw it something like this, that a normal for this plane from calc 2, you get from the coefficients, whatever they may be. And so the two planes being parallel equates to the two normals being parallel. And vectors are parallel if and only if one is a scalar multiple of the other. If you take a vector and multiply it by 2, you've got two parallel vectors. If you multiply it by a minus 2, they're still parallel, opposite directions different lengths, but still parallel. That's what I mean by parallel, anyway. So over here, as I just said, you're going to have parallel planes if and only if the normals are parallel, which means that, say, let's, this gradient is some scalar alpha or something, anyway, times your normal vector up there, which I labeled n. Now, the last quiz established in my mind that some of you could go back and review a little bit about vectors. A lot of you failed to compute a dot product properly. Okay, that's called a scalar product because when you do a dot product, you get a scalar from it. This is scalar multiplication. This just says that alpha times each of the components is the new alpha n. I'm going to drop it at that. It looks rather mathematical and theoretical, but when you plant your functions, etc., in here, 
you'll find that you've got just enough information to solve away. Uh, one of you who asked me was surprised to see so many square roots in the answer in the back of the book. The reason is that when you check out this equation, because it's a uh, hyperboloid, you'll find that there are squares there, and when you solve, you've got to take some square roots. So again, I'm waving my hands frantically. Rather than do it, I think if you plug things in, you'll find it works pretty well. And if it doesn't, you can come see me again. But uh, if you haven't done it, give it another shot. Okay, so let's push on now and talk about, well, the book says double integrals. My approach is to try to get something you can get your hands on. So what I've talked about is the notion of volume. So here's the problem we had up on the board last time. Find volume under a surface above a rectangular region. And it's <coughs> right there in color. I take this orange rectangle, move it up through the surface, getting this red trace, and I'd like to find out how much volume was swept out. I tried to also say last time that this is not really of any interest to any people, really. But when you get into your majors courses, oceanography, physics, chemistry, etc., you may find your problems, uh, basically this one right here, stated in different terms, of course. Real quick review. I've done this in some detail last time, but let's run it by you real fast just to warm you up for the idea. Back in Calc 1, you took an interval which is like our rectangle over here. You took a curve above that interval, which is like our surface, and you computed the area, much like my volume. That area was defined to be a limit of a sum of approximating areas. And I said that was Newton's guiding notion, that is, if you have a very messy looking object like this area, break it up into small pieces like these rectangles. You can find those rectangular areas easy enough. Delta A would be base times height, or length times height, however you want to say it. And the notation I used last time was let's make this X. Let's move over delta x units. So that means that the base is delta x. And if this is x, then the height of the rectangle that I've indicated here would be f of x. So I'm, I'll switch these backwards now. Height is f of x, base delta x. That means that my defining limit here could be written this way. It's a sum from a to b, f of x, delta x. The limit as the number of rectangles goes to infinity, bases go to zero. So you have zillions and zillions of rectangles up here. The more you pile in, the better it is. This limit you don't like to write down too often, so there was another symbol which we found to be not only appropriate but useful in Calc 2. Let me once again say that up to this point there is no calculus. That is, calculus in the sense of derivatives, etc. What comes, eventually, is that fundamental theorem of integral calculus, which says if you can find antiderivatives, oops, if you can find an antiderivative, that is a function whose derivative is a little f, then you can evaluate that symbol rather easily by just plugging in those numbers. Real big theorem. And of course, that's what you did all the time in calculus, too. Rarely did you ever have to do approximations because you didn't know what an antiderivative was. I suggested, though, last time you could use lots of rectangles if you had to, or trapezoids, or so-called Simpson's rule, which is on a lot of calculators. And I failed to mention, though I should have, if you look in the, the computer, Nat's computer, you'll find, I don't know, half a dozen programs <coughs> that will find area under a curve for you. You just have to define the function, the interval, and you turn it loose, and it does a great job. So there are very good numeric techniques for doing this without the limit if you can't find an antiderivative. That was Calc 2, believe it or not. Not all of it, of course, but a great deal of it. Can uh, anyone suggest what I'm going to do over here? Looking at that particular scenario over there. First, what do I have to do?
I'll point again. What do I have to do? Volume. Define volume. Everybody knows what volume is. You turn this thing upside down, you fill it with water. Eh, something like that. Well, anyway, we, we have to tell you what we think volume is. We're going to cook up some symbols. Non-calculus symbols in the sense that they don't tell you what the answer is. They just stand for the answer. And then ultimately, as your homework wants you to do, you figure out what those symbols equal, what the volume is. So it's kind of a three-stage process. Now let's get back to the first one, definition. Area was the limit of sums of approximating rectangles. Put that in words for this problem, somebody. Volume is what? Lim limit of sums of generic, okay, that's a word I didn't put up here. This is a generic rectangle has area, delta A, etc. So what do you think I'm going to have over here, just to fill in that, that statement? What am I going to plan over here? Rectangles won't work. Yeah, what your book calls them is uh, prisms, which doesn't probably sit in your mind right. It never does for me. A prism is what light shines through. That just shows you. I wasn't brought up on new math like some of you were. <coughs> prism is the right word. I like rectangular columns. Okay. What we're going to do is pack in lots and lots of rectangular columns under the surface. The more you pack, the better. Now, you might say, well, why worry about packing so many? Well, the reason is we're still going to have real rectangular cross-sections. That is, the tops of the columns will be horizontal with the xy plane. So as you can see here, they will never fit this particular surface. We're going to have the same problem we had over here. Sometimes the top is above, sometimes it's below. You can't establish which. The more you take, though, the better the job. In the limit, you would, in fact, have the volume. And that will be our definition. <coughs> the one good thing about this chapter is that you don't really, at this point anyway, have to draw surfaces. Uh, you've drawn a few already. It turns out that, uh, let's see here, we want three to here. Okay, here's the region that we were dealing with over there. This is the, where the inverted paraboloid punctures through the xy plane. And that rectangular region I have sketched would be this one right here. Goes over to three, up to one. Let's put a little r there. The book likes to do that for rectangular region or region in general. And by way of reference, that's, of course, this region in the xy plane here. Should be a little r down here. Like that. So you're looking, looking down on the xy plane. Last period I attempted to draw a column in there. was It got mixed reception, so I will not attempt to do that. Use your imagination. Inside there sits a generic rectangle. Here is its base. generic rectangular column. That's my phrase. Your book, of course, as I said, calls this a prism. Base of generic rectangular column, which has volume delta V equal to, well, why did we break this thing up into rectangular columns? Anybody have any good ideas? Well, that's ultimately we do want to sum them up and find the total volume in the limit or approximately. But why did I use rectangular columns? Why didn't I use something else? Uh, that's not even true. It, it, the statement is it's the best form to approximate. Well, that's like coming over here and saying that's the best form to approximate this integral. It is not, in fact. I would naturally use a trapezoid if I was stuck with an approximation problem. So it is not best for approximations. The value is easier to calculate for volume. 
Exactly. It's easy to compute. That's why I use rectangles here. Real easy to compute a rectangular area. When they get skinny, it doesn't make any difference whether you use trapezoids or whatever. So the same thing's going to happen over here. As they get skinny, it won't make any difference. So rectangular means what? If you've got a rectangular prism column, what would its volume be, Mr. Smith? Length times width times height. That's exactly what we need. So to finish out this problem at this stage, what I'll do is indicate that, uh, let's just look at the lower left-hand corner of this base. Here's x, here's y, and I'll go over delta x units and go up delta y units. There's the length times width that Mr. Smith just talked about. Okay, Mr. Ray, what's the height going to be? Function at x, y. I picked the lower left-hand corner rather arbitrarily, just as over here I happen to pick the left-hand corner of the, the bottom as well. So within your mind's eye, up here f of x, y units will be the top of this rectangular column. It's generic because there are lots of them lying all over this thing in some non-haphazard fashion. I don't want to go into drawing those quite yet. To finish it off algebraically, this would be f of x, y, delta x, delta y, as Mr. Smith said. A little bit of a comment to make here, and that is where do you pick your x, y? It may make a difference. It will not in the limit, but it may make a difference if you're using approximations. We'll come back to that shortly. So our volume, the total volume under the surface, and above R will be V, and then very lightly I'm going to put in approximately the sum. Well, it's really a double sum because I have to go in two directions <coughs> over R of these volumes. I have to go first, uh, say, in the X direction, and then pile on another, and then another, and another row. So it's really a double sum, both in the X and Y directions. At this point, if you didn't know any calculus, then I'd say, well, let's, let's pull out your calculators. We'll actually divide this up into a bunch of different pieces and make an approximation. We will, in fact, do that shortly. But pushing on, we'll come back and see what we could have done. What we will do is say the definition of volume or whatever you're talking about, in this case volume, the definition of volume will be the limit of these summed column volumes. What's the limit mean to you, Mr. Lauletta? What would you say in words? I don't, I don't want symbols, in fact. But in words, what does that limit mean <coughs> in terms of what you might see here? The best I don't know about best approximation. I'm sure if you came up with one, I could come up with one that's a little bit better. How could I do that? How could I get a better approximation? Now that I've tried to tell you that you could. In terms of uh, no, the question is, this is one possible approximation. Okay, so I'll mess up my picture. There are lo lots. Okay, exactly. You want things to get smaller. The bases you want to get smaller and more numerous columns. Just like over here, you wanted these widths to go to zero and the number of rectangles to go to infinity. Well, within that is what that says. You read your book if you want to see. They talk about a partition of the, the base and the norm of the partition going to zero. Okay, that's the formal way to do it. But again, in your mind, think of more and more columns, skinnier and skinnier bases, better and better approximations up here, and in the limit you got what you want. So far, so good. Let's put in what we really have here. Remember delta. V we found over here was altitude times base area. So that's literally what we have. Okay, Let's come back to Calc 2 again. I've just done this. I've got my volume definition. I've put what the little pieces are into that definition. And now I'm going to have to cook up some notation. 
Well, you may think it's calculus. It isn't. I just need a better symbol. I don't like writing this stuff down. What do you think it should be? What happens to sigmas in the limits? They become this uh, elongated <coughs> S. So what do you think I should have over here? Two elongated S's. And that's why the section is double integrals, or more appropriately, multiple integrals, depending on how many summations you have to have. Let's not get into limits of integration, so-called. Let's just put an R down there. And of course, f of x, y, dx, dy. What is that thing? It stands for volume today. Tomorrow in your physics class, it may stand for center of mass. I don't know. It could stand for a lot of things. But the point is, that's all it is. It's just a symbol. It stands for a quantity you're interested in and ultimately would like to be able to evaluate that quantity. Right now, it just stands for something. It still is a decent symbol, I think. We're adding up column volumes over a region, summing in two directions or two dimensions over a region. I think that symbol makes good sense. It looks fancy, but it contains the information I'm after. Still, up to this point, no calculus. And here I hope it's well impressed upon you that after doing so many problems, everyone says, looking at that, that's capital F of B minus capital F of A. You are doing a gigantic jump through this theorem to get that evaluation. We're at the same stage over here. I've got something, a symbol, I need to evaluate. How do I do it? Well, one hopes there's a nice theorem to get us through it. Let's not look at that quite yet. Let's back up and look at the idea of approximations. Specifically, your first homework problems in this chapter will look something like this. And I'll try to expand your picture so we can get at it. Once again, here's that base. And your homework problem might be something like this. Approximate the volume V with six columns. That's probably not the way it's stated in your book, but that's a paraphrasing of it. Approximate V with six columns, or whatever the problem specifically asks. OK, well. One thing, they will have to tell you what the surface is. It's our surface now. They have to tell you what the base region is. A little bit more about that in a few seconds. And they have to tell you how many rectangles or how you should divide up the base. If you have that, then it's time to whip out your calculator and go to town because it's just plain numerical work. What I mean by this and what I'm reading a lot into it, if this doesn't seem all that apparent to you, that's fine. It need not. What we're talking about is some kind of equal distribution of columns. You need not do that, but it makes life more pleasant. Six columns that look like this. Well, you're only looking at the bases again. Now, remember our surface. Let's come back here. There's your region R. Our surface starts up highest and then kind of drops off to the opposite vertex. So you have to imagine that out here, 36 units, is our surface, which kind of drops down towards the blackboard. In fact, is lowest right here on the opposite corner. <laughs> So out here probably sits the biggest column. But uh, I haven't really told you, for example, what the height of the column is. Remember, I had something down there about where is x, y. Let's assume that for today, anyway, we'll pick our x, y's down in the lower left-hand corners of my six rectangles. You need not do them all the same, but again, it's easier if you have one consistent pattern. So there will be my xy's. Let's just take this one right up here as an example. There is an xy <coughs> equal to, OK, this is 1, 2, 3. This would be 0.5. So in this case, it would be 1, 0.5. OK, and I'm talking about this column base right here. So as a column base, you look at it, you say, well, it's delta x equals 1 delta y equals 0.5, 
and the altitude would be F at 1, 0.05. So that column volume equals F at 1, 0.5 times point, well, let's do it the right way, I guess, 1 and 0.5. Use your calculator. You've got one of six columns now. You do the other five exactly the same way, you add up those columns, and you've got that approximation. Your homework problems, and there are only a couple of these, fortunately. You don't want to do this too much in your life. It kind of wears you down. Your homework problems will change it by saying, don't use lower left-hand corners. Hey, let's use upper right-hand corners. So it would be these three points for the lower row and then these three points up here for the next row. And if you read the book, I shouldn't say if, when you read the book, you will also find another choice other than corners are the centroids. These are the centers of the bases. So if you're asked to do it that way, then in this particular problem, the qu point in question would be 0.5 and 0.25. For that particular rectangle up here, it would have been 1.5 and 0. Uh, 0.75. Now since you only have six columns, you can imagine that there are going to be gigantic changes in the sums of those six column volumes. If you look at your surface over here, moving any column slightly probably is going to make quite a difference in terms of its altitude and thereby the, to the total volume that you're after. I don't think any of these approximations would be good simply because, Ms. Alvarez? You're not too sure about how good the approximation is. If you've got six fat rectangular, rectangular solids sitting underneath it, you've got six probably bad over or underestimates. Now, if you are a real optimist, you might say, well, maybe they'll just balance out. You know, where it underestimates on one side, it would overestimate on the other. That's kind of a reason why to take centroids. Because if your surface cuts down through the top, the centroid kind of gives you a, a column top, which is both above and below, depending on where you are. And things are a little bit better. Uh, I should also mention it would be smarter to use some kind of trapezoidal solids here, but that's off into some other course, I suspect like numerical analysis. Okay, so what can we do to overcome this problem about where the tops actually hit the surface? What's the supposedly the obvious thing to do? No, exactly, that's what I want. This limit, which does give you the actual value, if it can be computed, can be at least approximated by taking a very fine subdivision. In other words, instead of taking 6, maybe you ought to take 12 or 24 or, uh, what, 40,000? Anybody want to do that on the calculator? You got the all weekend. Obviously not. So what do you do? Don't know how to take the integral. What do you do? I haven't heard a good one yet. You need lots and lots of columns, and you don't want to do it on your calculator. Just find the average computer, program. computer program. I'm afraid you talk me into it. You have to do it pretty much that way if you don't have calculus. So you will find your next computer program there written up in complete detail. Uh, let me just talk it through since it's already on the board effectively one similar to it. What you will do is break up some base region rectangular region like this one into lots and lots of intervals in both directions, just like your first computer problem. You will have a grid that looks like this. Now, in your first computer problem, you let the computer march through compute altitudes, compared them, and found the highest altitude. This time, the computer marches through just as you did before, takes the altitude, but then multiplies it by the area of the base, which is common for every column, so it's one number. You don't have to recompute it every time. Compute the altitude times the area of the base, and then sum. You don't do an if-then statement to check out if it's a new max or not. 
you sum that new column volume. So it'll be a double loop, double nested loop, x, y direction, compute altitudes times base areas, sum them up, print out the sum. And that should be an approximation to the volume under the surface you're interested in. Now, among the comments I heard was, use calculus. Yes, we will now get to a calculus evaluation. But no, on that computer problem, there are two parts. One, you can do, you should be able to do. One, you will not be able to do. One of the surfaces, as uh, innocuous as it looks, turns out to be one that has, in effect, no antiderivative like we had back in, in Calc 2. So the second problem on your second computer problem, second part, has a surface by which you cannot attack with calculus means. You would have to use some kind of computer program. So there, there's no way for you to check. If part A works out, then I assume your program works properly and the answer to part B is what you get. But in effect, there is no calculus way to check that one out. So good luck on that. We'll see that, I hope, results in that in a, in a week. Let me continue on. This leaves you dangling still because I haven't told you what to do for your homework. All of those, you're supposed to use some kind of calculus technique. So let's come back up here and say, still, no calculus. But let me write it down again. Rf of x is 36 minus 3x squared minus 4y squared dx dy. Basically, the only change I'm going to make is putting down what you would call limits of integration. We'll let y go from 0 to 3, and we'll let x go from 0. Is that right? Backwards, isn't it? x goes from 0 to 3, and y goes from 0 to 1. Still the same rectangular base. <coughs> so that's a little bit new. We haven't had that in class yet. But still no calculus. I mean, what do you do with that thing? Before you do anything with it, let me give it its proper name. This is called a double integral for obvious reasons. The question is, how do you evaluate such a double integral? Yeah, question here. Um, Someone did this to me in the other section. Do you work inside out, etc.? You don't do anything yet because it's still no calculus. We're not working on it. I'm still writing down symbols. What you're anticipating is my next statement, which is the big one. Here comes the calculus. Big theorem, which says you can evaluate this double integral as an iterated integral. And in a week, I'm sure nobody will notice there's a difference. But there is. Let me try to make it strong. As a homework problem, now I'm telling you what to do. You first look at this either way, actually, but let's do it the way you see it. What you will first do is say, let's look at this calculus 2 integral. Okay, now when you eventually read your notes, you're going to miss the point, so I guess you just have to listen up at this, at this stage once you get it down. You concentrate on this calc 2 integral. Well, you might say that I didn't do any of those integrals in Calc 2. Well, that's because this is really uh, in disguise. This would be called a partial integral. It's partial because, in effect, what I want to do is hold x fixed and deal with one variable at a time, namely y now. Hold my x fixed and do a single integral, calc 2 style. Then, after I do what you see here in braces, after that, I will then do another calc 2 integral. x goes from 0 to 3, dx. That's why this thing, this whole thing, is called an iterated integral. And that's my response to Mr. Rogers, this double integral up here is still a symbol which can be evaluated as an iterated integral working inside out as you asked, 
I happen to be working dy first, then dx. It turns out it should make no difference, as you would suspect. I could have done dx first and dy. I haven't done either. I will do that shortly. But before I erase this to go on, notice down here it was a pretty easy step to do Calc 2 problems once you had capital F. What's coming up, if you think about it, is you've got to do capital F once and then again. That's the iteration. In effect, unpeel your double integral from the inside out to evaluate it each time with Calculus 2 techniques. Okay, let's go ahead and do that. Let me rewrite that integral now. Still, looks like this. Now I'm going to set off what we're dealing with in a little bit of color so you can see what's happening. You don't have to use braces, brackets, something like that might help. Here's the thing we're going to deal with right now. y equals 0 to 1, 36 minus 3x squared minus 4y squared dy, and to indicate x is being fixed, I hold it in white. You don't worry about that yet. Now for those that had trouble with partial derivatives, you're going to have trouble again because what you have to do is take a partial integral. You have to hold, in this case, x fixed. So you look at that and say as a function of y in there, we're going to get 36y minus 3 what? yx squared. Now I'm going to keep y in the second part. Same thing. How about that one? 4y cubed over 3. It's a y integral. Now you put in the y limits of integration. y equals 0 to y equals 1 dx. You don't do anything with x until you're done with the inside integral. You plug in those numbers. What are we going to have in here? 36 minus 3x squared. That's a 1 there. Minus 4 thirds 1 cubed. Minus putting in y equals 0 doesn't give you anything. So we're left with that expression. There went the first or inside integral. Now you go through it again. This is, again, a Calc 2 problem. This one's a lot simpler because there aren't any extraneous variables. So you shouldn't have trouble with this one. Mr. Toll, why don't you help me out on this one? What are we going to do? Integral. You could possibly combine these two. I don't know. It's probably worth our effort. 36 minus 4 thirds. Yeah, 108 thirds minus 4 gives you 104 thirds, I guess. And integrating with respect to x, you get that minus, what's this going to give us? X Just x cubed, right? <coughs> so, for those that uh, wonder what's going on at this point, just like Calc 2, you plug those in, 104 minus 27. Close, just 77 this time. Okay, what did we just do? By calculus, what did we just do? We found the volume. That thing we were looking for, we now have. Exactly 77 cubic units, whatever the units may be. Not terribly difficult, but you can see the handwriting on the wall, I hope. The obvious one is this iteration process. That's why you have your little tables books. Because once you integrate something, it usually gets to be a little bit messier. And once you integrate it again, of course, it's, uh, it's terrible. But I think you'll find most of your problems are, at least to begin with, no more difficult than this. What you don't see written on the wall, because I picked such a simple problem, are these limits of integration. Now this time, it was just a plain old rectangle. No problem. But I don't think you're going to see many of those kinds of exercises, you're going to find that the region you're interested in is much more complicated than just a rectangle. In fact, if I were you, thinking about problems that would be, let's say, natural, you might ask yourself, 
Well, what is the volume over the xy plane? What is the entire bullet shape above the xy plane? If you ask that, then you say, hmm, look what happens. This region in the xy plane is no longer a rectangle, but some kind of ellipse. Well, what happens then? Obviously, this stuff doesn't work. You're going to have to put some other things in there, more appropriate things. It turns out that it's not as bad as you might think. What you have to do is describe the ellipse appropriately in the y and x direction. So that turns out to be relatively easy. However, the problems, if you don't see the picture, can be terribly difficult. If you go into a problem and look at the algebraic statement without something like this in the back of your mind, you're going to be staring at it for quite a long time before you come over and say, gee, we better put down these for our y limits, we better put these down for our x limits. And that's the story I told you a few days back. This is where I was when I was an undergraduate. You put the wrong thing down here, and you may spend quite a long time doing all of this for naught. You, know, you might be perfect at finding antiderivatives and evaluating them, but you didn't have the right problem to start with. I'll give you the same word of warning I had that time when I told you that story. Be sure you recognize surfaces and can at least visualize them, if not sketch them. Paraboloids, hyperboloids, ellipsoids, those kinds of things. Because the problems coming down the pike are find the volume above this paraboloid and below this ellipsoid, <coughs> some kind of elliptical cut of a parabolic bowl. They probably won't say it that way, but that's what it comes down to. And you've got to look at that and say, OK, my limits of integration are such and such. The region is such and such. Write down the integral, evaluate it by calculus. The evaluation will be easy. I think you'll find the difficulty in writing down the thing in the first place. Read the section, but read it with a little bit of, let's say, a grain of salt, because a lot of it is a lot of details that I think are not necessary. Try to look at your homework problems over the weekend and try to get into what those problems ask you to do. I will do more examples on Monday, which will look like those problems. However, I notice a lot of you kind of don't know what's going on. I think to key yourself up, you better look at the homework problems and see you at least anticipate what's going to be happening. And then maybe you'll appreciate a little bit more what we do in class. Okay, we'll see you then.